The desert has always been marketed as a kind of end of the map, a place where geography triumphs over humanity. Little rain, relentless sun, saline soil, cities that seem to exist out of sheer stubbornness. But in recent years, northern Mexico has begun to attract a different kind of attention. Not the romantic attention of those filming sand dunes at sunset, but the cold attention of those calculating megawatts, liters per second, industrial routes, and political stability. And this is where the phrase that sounds like an exaggeration but isn't, is born. There's a plan underway to change the Mexican desert, not in the poetic sense of making it rain, but in the concrete sense of redesigning what is possible to live and produce there. What's happening isn't a miracle. It's engineering, energy, logistics, and above all, a silent struggle for water. The most common mental trick is to imagine that ending the desert means planting trees and turning sand into a garden. But the real world doesn't work like advertising. Deserts don't disappear. They are circumvented, tamed in sections, connected to systems that import water from afar or manufacture it from the sea, and then they become useful for something very specific. And when an arid region becomes useful, it becomes the stage for a race. It's not a race of tourists. It's a race of infrastructure, power, contracts, concessions, and promises. The kind of race where construction begins before the public understands why it exists. Northern Mexico has something the 21st century values more than beautiful landscapes. Space, sun, and geographic position. The sun there isn't climate, it's fuel. Space isn't emptiness, it's freedom to build on scale. And its geographic position, right next to the United States, is the short bridge to the factory of the world that is trying to shorten its own supply chains. The buzzword is nearshoring. But the truth is more uncomfortable. Bringing industry closer isn't just changing the geography of production. It's changing the geography of stress. A factory doesn't just need workers and roads. It needs constant water, constant energy and predictability. And predictability is exactly what the climate crisis has been destroying. So the plan starts to make sense when you see how the pieces fit together. Mexico, especially in states like Sonora and Baja California, is trying to position itself as an industrial and energy platform. This includes, for example, mega projects that bet on desert radiation as a competitive advantage. It's no secret that a photovoltaic complex in Puerto Penasco, Sonora, is being structured to reach a capacity of one gigawatt with announced expansion phases and completion timelines over the next few years. A gigawatt isn't a pretty headline number. It's a game-changing scale locally. It's enough energy to attract new industrial loads, support pumping systems, power desalination, stabilize grids, and of course, become a piece of political discourse about a sustainable future. But then the first contradiction appears. The desert has sun, but it doesn't have water. Cheap and abundant energy without water becomes an engine without fuel. And this is where the part of the plan that many people don't want to face comes in. Water isn't a detail. It's the bottleneck. What's being designed is a combination of three paths, each with its own list of hidden costs. Transferring water from inland basins to cities and industrial hubs, producing new water through desalination, and reusing urban and industrial water on a larger scale. All of this simultaneously, because none of these paths alone can meet what is being promised. Transferring water sounds simple in a sentence, but it's explosive in practice. When you move water from one place to another, you don't just move molecules, you move power. You choose who grows and who stagnates. An emblematic case in Sonora is the Independence Aqueduct, designed to carry significant volumes of water from the Yaqui River region, from the El Novillo Dam, to supply Hermosillo. Public descriptions of the project point to an annual transfer in the tens of millions of cubic meters. Technically, it's supply. Socially, it can be a spark, because for indigenous Yaqui communities, water isn't just a resource. It's a historical right, territory survival. And when the state builds a pipe that reorders the destiny of water, the construction becomes a dispute of legitimacy. What for one side is a solution for the city, for another is appropriation. Even more so when there are allegations of inadequate consultation and conflicts that span years. Here arises a question that few dare to ask aloud. 
When you say you're going to develop the desert, develop for whom? For the resident who pays dearly for a water truck, for the farmer who depends on a lowering aquifer, for the community that sees water passing through a pipe towards a growing city, or for the industry that arrives with incentives, tax breaks and promises of jobs, but also with constant consumption and bargaining power. The second path, desalination, seems even more seductive because it promises a kind of modern magic, turning the sea into a tap. And technically, it is possible. The issue is the price, economic, energetic and environmental. Projects like the desalination plant associated with Rosarito in Baja, California, appear in financing and planning documents with large numbers, phases that can reach several cubic meters per second of capacity and a relevant electricity demand in the tens of megawatts. This is enough water to affect the urban supply of an entire region, and it's also enough energy to require a more robust grid, stable contracts, and a reality that doesn't always align with political promises. Desalination has a side that rarely makes the thumbnail what to do with the brine. You extract fresh water and are left with a saline concentrate that needs to be returned to the sea carefully, with diffusers, monitoring and serious licensing. Who pays this bill when the project starts to falter? What if operating costs rise? What if energy becomes more expensive? It's at this point that manufactured water stops being a symbol of progress and becomes a risk spreadsheet. Even so, Baja California Sur and Los Cabos, for example, have lived for years with a reality where desalination isn't a luxury. It's tourism and urban survival. There are announced projects with capacities in the hundreds of liters per second, aimed at supplying hundreds of thousands of people, with deadlines that come and go according to bidding, financing and political rhythm. This shows the ambivalence. Yes, water can be produced. No, this doesn't make the desert fertile. It makes certain cities operable. It's a brutal difference. The desert doesn't become a garden. It becomes a platform. The third path, reuse, is the smartest and least glamorous. Reusing treated water for industry, controlled irrigation and aquifer recharge reduces pressure on natural sources. But reuse requires management, public trust, oversight and infrastructure. It doesn't yield easy votes like inaugurating a gigantic project. However, in a future of scarcity, reuse is the kind of solution that separates mature societies from societies that live by improvisation. Now place these three paths within the larger chessboard that northern Mexico is facing. The Colorado River crisis and the stress of water agreements with the United States. There's a historic treaty that guarantees annual deliveries of the Colorado River to Mexico in a significant amount. However, with the worsening drought and the drop in reservoirs like Lake Mead, binational mechanisms have emerged that foresee reductions under certain conditions, with minutes detailing how both parties share the pain when the system collapses. This isn't a legal detail. It's a sign of the times. When even water guaranteed by treaty needs a scarcity clause, it means the 21st century is renegotiating what the 20th century swore was fixed. And on the other side of the border, water has also become political currency. The issue of the Rio Grande, for example, appears in recent reports and diplomatic pressures because it involves periodic obligations from Mexico and an internal dispute over who seeds water in times of drought. It doesn't matter if you're a geopolitics expert. Basic understanding is enough. Water, when it's scarce, becomes an argument for tariffs, retaliation and public blackmail. And a country that wants to be a regional industrial power cannot afford to appear fragile in its own supply. This is where the narrative of the end of the desert gains its real meaning. It's not a project of nature. It's a project of operational sovereignty. It's about transforming an arid region into a region that can handle a load. Industrial load, urban load, energy load. And for that, you need something the desert doesn't give for free, water stability. The plan, at its core, is to create a kind of technological shell over the desert, a layer of infrastructure that makes the region function despite its local ecology, not because of it. But every shell has cracks, and that's where the gray area that separates propaganda from a possible future comes in. Because when you inject energy and imported water into a desert, you create growth, but growth creates demand, 
and demand puts even more pressure on water. It's a vicious cycle. The desert becomes a victim of its own success. Cities grow, land becomes more expensive, industry demands guarantees, tourism expands, and then any failure, a longer drought, a construction delay, a social conflict, becomes a systemic crisis. And there's a detail that is often hidden. The Mexican desert isn't empty. It has people. It has rural communities, indigenous peoples, farmers, ecosystems adapted to scarcity. When you redesign water, you redesign the lives of these people. And the redesign isn't always negotiated fairly. The case of the Independence Aqueduct and the tensions involving the Yaqui starkly show this. The same infrastructure that a city sees as salvation can be perceived as expropriation by those who live at the water's origin. This isn't a romantic obstacle to development. It's a real risk that can halt construction, generate blockades, lead to lawsuits and ultimately erode the state's legitimacy. From a historical perspective, this attempt to tame the desert is not new. There's an old imaginary that modernity triumphs over aridity with canals, dams and pumps. What has changed now is the scale and context. Before, the promise was irrigate to produce food. Today, the promise is energize to produce economy. Agriculture remains central, but industry and logistics have become the focus. And this changes the type of conflict. You're not just fighting for water to plant, you're fighting for water to manufacture, cool, clean, process, and maintain industrial parks that cannot tolerate interruptions. And then, the desert sun once again appears as a savior, but with irony. Gigantic scale solar energy can theoretically sustain desalination and pumping, reducing dependence on fossil fuels and making water more possible. But solar energy requires transmission lines, maintenance, grid integration, storage, and above all, governance, so it doesn't become an incomplete monument. The same grandeur that makes the project impressive also makes it vulnerable. Just one political bottleneck, a stalled bid, a shift in priorities, and what was the future becomes an expensive skeleton in the desert. The viewer might be asking, so is this good or bad? The serious answer is, it depends on the price you're willing to pay and who pays that price. It's good if it means more reliable water for populations currently living in water precariousness. It's good if it means cleaner energy and stable jobs. But it's bad if it means privatization of access, tariffs that push out the poorest, coastal degradation from poorly managed brine, and social conflicts over transfers that ignore historical rights. There is also a moral, almost philosophical risk which is the risk of technological self-deception. When a society learns that it can manufacture seawater and pull water through aqueducts, it can lose its sense of limits. And the desert, by definition, is a limit. It reminds us that nature doesn't negotiate with discourse. Technology can push the limit further, but it doesn't remove the limit from the system. If you create an economy in the desert that depends on eternal cheap energy and an always available sea, you're assuming that the environmental and operational costs will remain manageable. That's a gamble, not a certainty. And this is where the plan no one is seeing truly reveals itself. It's not a secret document. It's not a conspiracy. For it's something worse and more mundane, a convergence of interests that happens in silence, because it makes sense for each actor in isolation. For the state government, it's development and political narrative. For investors, it's an opportunity in energy and infrastructure. For industries, it's logistics and proximity to the US. For cities, it's a chance to grow. And for local communities, it can be both hope and threat. Each party sees only its piece, but the complete mosaic points in the same direction. The desert won't end. It will be reconfigured to serve a new kind of economy. And like any reconfiguration, it brings an ethical question that no one likes to answer. If you have the technology to bring water to an industrial hub, why does a neighborhood still depend on water trucks? If you have the energy to sustain a desalination plant, why is the management of urban leaks and losses still treated as a footnote? If you can achieve the impossible in engineering, why do you fail at the basics of governance? Perhaps the answer lies in what truly drives this process. It's not compassion, it's competition. The world is reorganizing production chains 
and Mexico wants to be a decisive node in this new map. The desert, with its sun and proximity, is perfect for this, as long as you solve the water problem. So water becomes the invisible infrastructure that defines who wins. And when water defines who wins, decisions are no longer just technical. They become political in the crudest sense, choices about who matters. In the end, the idea of the end of the desert is a useful phrase because it provokes the mind, but it can also numb. It makes it seem like we're talking about nature when we're talking about power. The Mexican desert isn't being defeated. It's being negotiated piece by piece with concrete, electricity, and pipes. What's at stake isn't just the landscape. It's the model of the future that will be built there. A future where water is a fairly distributed right or a future where water is a competitive advantage for those who can afford it. And now comes the uncomfortable question that lingers after the video ends. If the desert can be transformed by infrastructure, what is the next limit that society will try to solve in the same way? And what happens when the bill, finally, comes due for everyone at the same time?